Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the next instalment of the um, African Union Smart Safety Surveillance Capacity Strengthening Program. We are now uh, moving into module four of, uh, of this uh, program. Um, module four is on safety communications. We've already gone through the uh, modules on data collection, signal detection, and um, most recently benefit risk assessment. Um, so safety communications um, will be uh, the next area, um, the, the, the uh, very important outputs of those assessments that, that we've recently covered. Um, as always, we welcome uh, colleagues from across the African Union and uh, with other uh, stakeholders, all very welcome um, at this session. For, um, uh, next slide please, uh, by way of background for colleagues who may be uh, joining specifically for the safety communication aspects, I'll just give a bit of background on uh, the MHRA. This has been more extensively covered uh, in module one, but just a bit of a recap in case uh, colleagues um, are joining for the first time. The MHRA is the UK uh, regulator for medicines and medical devices. It's our responsibility to make sure that medicines and vaccines and devices work and are acceptably safe. And uh, that is uh, done through the core activities of product licensing, including clinical trials, inspections, enforcement, and for the purposes of, of this uh, capacity strengthening program, pharmacovigilance. We are an executive agency of uh, the UK's Department of Health and, and Social Care. We number around 1,200 or so staff and are primarily located in uh, Canary Wharf in central London and our National Institute for Biological Standards and Control which is the organization, the part of the organization that does, um, in, for, importantly today, uh, batch release uh, for, for vaccines, and they're based just outside London. Our vision, and uh, I think it's important to, to share this with um, participants today, our vision is that we promote and protect uh, and improve the health of uh, millions of people every day through the activities of regulated medicines and medical devices. Now, as a UK regulator, our priority and uh, our immediate area of focus is on UK citizens, but um, we firmly believe that uh, medicines safety, vaccine safety, device safety is a, is a global issue and we share information every day with global partners we work in a, a very networked way with other regulatory authorities around the world sharing information. So our activities in the Smart Safety Surveillance Program, we think are very important for that ambition of, of global um, medicines and vaccine safety. If we're all using the same vaccine, uh, we can learn from each other, we can pick up new signals from other countries uh, possibly before we can pick them up in the UK. So it's in all of our interests to work together on programmes such as the African Union Smart Safety Surveillance for the benefit of populations that, that we're working with. But the knock-on effect is that it may um, have a positive impact on the UK population and, and, and globally. So hence our motivation for being involved in programmes such as this. So back to today's, uh, where we are today, we're in the uh, module four, as I said, on safety communications. So um, today and next week, we'll be covering risk communication, how that is done uh, both for routine and in, in a crisis, the different types of media uh, that, that can be used and um, how we handle the media, and then some special uh, considerations, particularly uh, relevant today on, uh, for, for vaccines. Next week, we'll be moving into decision making in communications. And then uh, to conclude the programme, uh, next month, we'll be moving into 
the role of pharmacovigilance expert advisory committees and uh, how committees are, are run and managed and sharing the experience of the UK. So uh, today is the first session of module four. I think the, the title there should say risk communications, apologies for that. Um, so just an hour today, uh, looking at um, aspects of safety communications. As always, we'll have a Q&A uh, um, at the end. So we, uh, if we just look at the next slide, I think there's, um, oh, sorry. So uh, the, the aims are to better understand the, the principles of communications, the channels that are used, uh, how to look for success criteria provide an understanding of crisis management and urgent communications i think again something that is um at this moment in time as we are rolling out vaccines and there's a lot of focus on regulatory agencies immunization programs vaccine hesitancy and vaccine safety um the role of communications uh, particularly in a crisis such as we're all in has never been uh, more important so uh, there'll be there'll be a focus on that as, as mentioned alongside that, how to handle the media. Um, and um, then we'll, we'll conclude next week with the rationale for decision-making in, in communications. So as, as mentioned, we'll have a Q&A at the end. Uh, we have a Q&A uh, box you can see there uh, towards the middle right-hand side. Please use that option uh, for submitting questions for us to pick up in that Q&A session. Please only use the chat function if uh, to inform us of any technical issues you might be experiencing. Um, everyone will, will be on, on mute throughout the, we often get people in these sessions using the uh, raise hand function. I'm afraid we can't respond to that. We can only respond to questions uh, using the, the Q&A box. So I encourage you to do that. As always, these sessions will, this session is being recorded. All of the uh, previous sessions have been recorded and are made available uh, for people who cannot um, attend the live broadcast. So um, this will be made available shortly after today's session. We'd encourage you to share it with, with colleagues. So um, I am um, very pleased to be joined today by Catherine Ord who's a unit manager in our benefit risk management group. And uh, Catherine is going to take you through session one of module four. Catherine, over to you. Thanks, Mick. Uh, yes, yeah, so today I wanna to talk about um, risk communication. And this is a really important part of regulation because you've heard already um, across a few sessions about you know, the different areas of regulation, how we look at um, as signals and um, perform safety reviews. But if we decide that there is a need to change clinical practice to protect patient safety, it's really important that we communicate this so that the right people hear that message and act upon it. Next slide, please. So today I'm just gonna talk about some of the key principles of, of communications in, on risk, um, including key messages. I'm gonna talk a bit about the different channels for communication and how you might decide which one to use as well as looking at outcomes and measuring the success of your communications. I'm gonna talk a bit about crisis management and issuing urgent communications, uh, a little bit about how to handle media and the different types of media, and then finish off with um, just a bit on special considerations for vaccines and how this might differ to communications for um, medicines. Next slide, please. So just to start off with, um, why do we need communications? So at the time of licensing, most medicines have been tested in maybe a few thousand people. So we have a good idea about how well they work and what their overall safety profile is likely to be. Um, but in time, as medicines get used by more and more people, um, we'll have more information about their safety as rarer side effects start to be seen and reported. Sometimes a company might have committed to do additional studies to look at efficacy and that data becomes available um, after marketing. So the balance and benefits and risk is not fixed. It might change either because new efficacy data becomes available or because new safety concerns come to light. So because of this, sometimes we need to change the way the medicine is used. Um, so this can be a change to you know, the indications, the, the reasons why the medicine is used in the first place. There might be a need to change dosing um, 
or you know reduce the dose in certain situations or temporarily interrupt it we might need to perhaps restrict the patients who can take a particular medicine or the way in which they use that medicine um, sometimes there's no need to particularly restrict use of the medicine but we just need to make information available to people about new side effects which have been discovered um, or if it's a side effect that we already know about if there's any new information which comes to light about that perhaps it might be more having more severe effects than it had previously or be affecting different patients to those who had, had that particular side effect in the first place. Um, regardless, when there is a change to the balance of benefits and risks and either a need to change the way the medicine is used or there's a need to make people aware of new information about safety, we need to make sure we actively communicate it so that healthcare professionals and the patients who take the medicines know about it. Next slide, please. So thinking about getting the message right, um, we need to think about what are the key messages that we need people to be aware of. So we need to make sure that we provide balanced information about benefits and risks. Um, it's important not to focus just on risk because that tends to frighten people and that put more in the medicine, which is something we don't want to happen. We need to make sure that people are also reassured about um, the, the benefits of the product and why, they, why they've been asked to take it in the first place. It's sometimes helpful, if possible, to present data in a graphical way. We know from studies that patients sometimes very, find it very hard to grasp the concept of risk and how that might affect them individually. Most people can't picture what a risk of one in 10,000 looks like. And there are all kinds of ways to, th to think about expressing this sort of information. Um, they, the slide that's up at the moment shows one way of sharing this, this type of information, which is a kind of number needed to treat to benefit and number needed to treat to harm. And sometimes if you can present information in that way where you provide um, a balanced display of information about benefits alongside information about risk, it helps people to better understand um, what the balance is. Um, it's important also to address uncertainties. Um, so sometimes we might have some early information about a new safety concern, but we're not entirely sure yet what that looks like, who might be most affected. Um, so it's important to be clear um, in communications about what the source of the information is, whether it's early data or final data, um, what the data has arisen from, so whether that's spontaneous reports or a clinical trial or a new um, observational study. If the data are preliminary, we can say that, and we can say that we'll provide more information in future, um, you know, when the final data become available. What's really important is to use plain language. Um, so we have to bear in mind, I think in the UK, the average reading age um, of the whole population is 12. So in essence, you have to try to pitch any communications to sort of, you know, um, teenage level reading ability, just to make sure that people can really understand the information you're trying to get across. Um, it's sometimes helpful to consult patients about wording. So um, something that we do at the MHRA is we have a, a patient engagement team who will reach out to patient organisations and we'll ask them um, about wording that we're thinking about sending out in communications. So we internally might have thought that we have a clear message and when we actually ask patients about it, they very often come back and say, well, I don't understand that. I think it would be better to say this. And it can be really helpful to get patients' perspectives on messages that you're thinking of using. A really important part of um, the key messages is what is the advice? So this will be what is the advice for healthcare professionals? What's the advice for patients? Sometimes those can be different because sometimes it's a case of a decision that would be taken by a doctor on whether or not to use a particular medicine in a patient. Whereas for patients, sometimes they need to know about a side effect, need to know which symptoms to be aware of, and importantly, what action to take if they should experience those symptoms. Next slide, please. Um, staying on the theme of getting the message right, there's all sorts of things you can say about a side effect to a medicine. Um, and you know, new information about that might come to light at any time. So you might see a change in the seriousness of the reactions that have been reported and how severe they are. You might see a change in frequency, perhaps they're becoming more commonly reported than they have been in the past. You might notice that a particular reaction only happens in certain individuals with certain risk factors. Um, you might have new information about time to onset, how long it takes for a side effect to occur, and also about reversibility. You know, can you provide reassurance that if a patient stops taking a medicine, then their side effect will go away and they will recover from it. 
Um, when we're talking about framing risk, um, it's usually best to talk about absolute risk. So that is the risk to a particular person. If you talk about relative risk, where you're talking about, you know, your risk might be double, that can be quite frightening for people. And if you talk about an increase of two or threefold in a particular risk, but if the risk itself is very rare, then doubling risk from one in a million to two in a million isn't really all that concerning. So it's really best to talk about absolute risk where you can and to try to frame it in a way that people can understand. So we wouldn't normally say 10% of patients because people don't always understand percentages. We'd be more likely to say one in 10 patients. There's also ways to frame risk. So it's best to use positive messages. So you might say up to one in 10 rather than as many as one in 10. And it's the same information, but it's just phrased in a slightly different way to make it less frightening for people. Um, it's important to say why the information is being provided now to people. Um, it might be something that we want to give people some early notification of. It might be because we have the final results of a study in. But when we're designing our communications, it's useful to mention what is a particular reason for communicating on this now. Um, it's also good to state where possible that it's been agreed with the regulatory agency. Um, on the whole, we try to limit the number of safety communications that are sent to healthcare professionals because they get sort of um, alert fatigue. If they get too fed up of receiving warnings and alerts, then they just put them all in the bin. They don't read any of them. And, you know, in the long term, it's quite damaging, actually, to how how well communications land with people. So for that reason, we try to make sure that if it's something that we've agreed with the company, that that's mentioned somewhere in the communication. Sometimes we will communicate on something which is already known about, but where we feel there isn't um, you know, good knowledge of that, or sometimes it might be a new risk which is being added to the product information for the first time. Um, and where that's the case, we would usually mention that in our communications. Um, we might include some further relevant background information in the communication, so about use of the medicine, which people are likely to be taking it, uh, or more information about the particular data which has led to the safety update. And it's also good to include some kind of contact point for further queries. People always have questions, so it's best to provide them with a clear channel of communication with you so that they can come back to you with any questions if they have them. Next slide, please. So moving on to recipients and the target audience, this really comes back to what is the advice? Because sometimes it might be something that healthcare professionals need to know about because it might affect whether they prescribe the medicine or who they prescribe it to. Um, it may relate to dispensing of medicines or it might be advice for patients. So, you know, a new side effect and symptoms that they should be aware of and what actions to take if they occur. Um, we can target communications to all sorts of people and we can design communications which are targeted to particular people. So we can target them towards patients uh, or consumers. Um, carers of people with health problems um, or healthcare professionals directly. We may also want to send the communications to other recipients. So for example, um, all of the people that the communications are targeted towards as well as organisations that represent them. So in the UK, we have an awful lot of charities who represent people with particular health conditions like Asthma UK, for people with asthma, um, diabetes UK for people with diabetes. So if we have some new safety communications to put out, we will generally contact those organisations organizations as well so that they can amplify our messages um, and make sure that uh, the patients who have those diseases are aware of this new information. When we're thinking about healthcare professionals and which healthcare, healthcare professionals we need to target the medicine at, we generally think carefully about the way in which the medicine is used. So if it's a medicine which is generally dispensed in community pharmacies, um, then we can target those types of pharmacists. Um, we will also target communications to pharmacists where it involves over-the-counter medicines that are bought from pharmacies without a prescription. Some medicines are only used in, in care homes uh, or in hospitals, and in those situations we would target communications just to the people who work in those, those situations. And there are other types of prescribers as well, um, beyond doctors and hospital doctors who can prescribe. So nurses can prescribe in the UK as well as dentists. And there may be other specialities as well who have um, a, you know, a special legal dispensation to prescribe medicines. And where that's the case, we can target communications to those people as well. Next slide, please. 
So thinking about different channels for communication, um, on this slide, I've just basically included all the, the main ones you would think about. So the press and media is an important one, and I'll talk a bit more about that uh, in a bit. But the press and media, generally, most people watch TV or read a newspaper or get news on their phone. And for that reason, the media can be a really important source of information for people about, about risks of medicines. Where a message might be quite urgent, we can think about using alerting systems. Um, and where we want every single healthcare professional to make sure, we want to make sure every healthcare professional has received uh, a particular communication, we can send that to them directly with a letter. We can also issue, issue regular bulletins that include information about drug safety. Uh, we can make use of social media as well as traditional media like the press and TV. Um, the product information legally has to be kept up to date with new information on safety, um, but some people do use that as a source of information. Um, so, you know, that in itself could be an important way to communicate new information on risk. And we can also work closely with other regulators and uh, other healthcare bodies to communicate information about drug safety. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the different ways of communicating that we use in the UK. Um, in the UK, we have something called the Central Alerting System which has been in place, I think, since about 2008 and replaced older ways to alert healthcare professionals to, to safety information in general. So this is a web-based cascade system um, for issuing patient safety alerts. And um, it covers all sorts of different types of alerts from across the healthcare sector. So these are national patient safety alerts, which aren't just related to medicines, but can cover all kinds of things. Um, it covers alerts on estates and facilities um, for hospitals. It will carry alerts from the chief medical officer that all healthcare professionals need to be aware of. Um, it might alert people to any disruption in supply. So if there's some problem in the supply chain or shortage of medicine, um, that can be flagged up through this system. It all talk, also talks about field safety notices for medical devices. Um, it can also include drug alerts issued by the MHRA and or drug companies. Um, people are generally alerted to something on the um, central alerting system by email. So people can sign up for this, but generally speaking, people who are quite senior in a healthcare professional organisation, so, you know, hospital directors, will get this information and will be asked to cascade it to people who need to know. Um, there are different types of alert and these depend on what the type of action needed is. So what are called class one alerts. Um, these require immediate action, perhaps where a medicine needs to be recalled um, to patient level because we are concerned about the safety of a product and we don't want patients to take any more of it. Um, other types of alert might be less urgent or require less urgent action. And generally these are um, designated with different classes two to four. Um, but this is a very good way to basically rapidly get information out to people who really need to see it. Next slide, please. Um, so I've already mentioned, um, excuse me, ambulance going past. Um, I've already mentioned about letters to healthcare professionals. Uh, in the past, these used to be called Dear Doctor letters. Certainly in the EU, um, since 2012, these have, these have been rebadged as direct healthcare professional communications. Um, in, within companies, they are called Dear Healthcare Provider letters. Uh, but essentially, they are written by the company and they usually carry company branding, but they are agreed with regulatory authorities. And I've already mentioned about um, there being sort of hesitancy to issue too many safety alerts because people tend to get alert fatigue. So it's important that we reserve these types of letters for situations where some kind of urgent action is needed or some kind of new restriction is in use. So we wouldn't tend to send these types of letters for new side effects to medicines that don't require any particular action. We're more likely to send these letters if there is perhaps a new contraindication in certain patients or a need to carry out a particular type of monitoring. So for example, liver function testing um, in relation to a particular safety concern. Um, there are issues about how these letters can be sent. Traditionally, they were always sent on paper, but you know sometimes the people that get the post for a doctor is not the doctor. Sometimes, you know, a secretary might open a letter, decide the doctor doesn't need to see it, um, put it in the bin. You know, these types of letters, even if they are addressed to doctors, don't always get read by doctors. So the temptation is then to move over to email, but there are also some challenges with that because it's very difficult to maintain an up-to-date email 
um, list. You know, people quite often change their email address or have problems with email. So um, it's not always possible to ensure that you're reaching all the right people via email. And there are also more opportunities for something not to get read. So it might go into someone's junk mail folder. They might see the email but not read it. They might open the email but get distracted and not read it. They might not realise the email has an attachment. So there are all sorts of different ways in which communication can fail if you only rely on email. So it's good to think about that and think about the best way to make sure these letters actually get to their intended recipients. Um, it's good to have a communication plan around these. Normally, when a company submits a DHPC for approval, they will also submit a communication plan at the same time. So this will clearly set out exactly which healthcare, healthcare professionals will be sent the communication, um, what the planned data communication is. And it will also set out in advance, you know, how many days the regulator has to review the letter, um, how many days the company might have to revise it. There's a clear timeline for agreement of the DHPC. Um, just to mention at the bottom, it's not something that we do for medicines, but for medical devices, um, our colleagues do something called consolidation, which is where they, they basically send up follow up um, forms to people who've been sent these letters to say, did you get this letter? Did you read it? Did you understand it? So it's a more active way to follow up whether this information has been sent out, received, read and understood. Next slide, please. I've also mentioned about safety bulletins. Um, in the UK, our current drug safety uh, bulletin is called Drug Safety Update. This goes out every month. Um, we have planning meetings every month to decide which issues might be coming up that you know are on our horizon that we're aware of that we might need to communicate on. Um, and we have a very set format for these. We normally include not too many um, issues in each each copy of drug safety update. It's normally between two and four new drug safety issues that we might want to highlight. So we think very carefully about which one's the really important one that we need to tell people about. Before we had drug safety update, we had an older publication called Current Problems in Pharmacovigilance. This started in about 1975 and we had it until about 2007. And initially it was sent out a few times a year. And as time went on, we sent out fewer and fewer um, individual copies of current problems but each copy had more and more drug safety updates in it. So the first few that were sent out in around 1976 only had one or two drug safety issues in them. And by the end, they had about 24, 24 drug safety issues in every single um, edition. And it was a bit much for people to plow through. So we switched to a completely different format where we, we would just make this a very targeted, focused look at just a handful of medicines and we send it out every single month around the same time. Um, People can subscribe to it, essentially, you know, by it's a voluntary thing that people can sign up to, but we do encourage it. Um, and it's sent out to subscribers, um, healthcare professionals, clinical and professional organisations, uh, information providers and patient groups. We are able to monitor email delivery and we can also, because we host it on our website as a, as a PDF, as well as in a web format, we can monitor exactly how many page views we've had on drug safety update in that particular month. I think we can also look at where people have come to from you know, other websites. So we know which links people are following, generally people how, how people find out about drug safety update. Um, I've mentioned briefly already, we have a very standard format for the articles. They have a very short snappy title that really has, you know, what is the issue being um, talked about here. Um, next, it has a series of bullets which outline advice to healthcare professionals. There are subheadings which allow us to include more detailed information about something, as well as links to further information, including usually an encouragement to report side effects through the yellow card scheme. Next slide, please. <coughs> um, I've also mentioned briefly social media. Um, I say this is an evolving field because the way in which we use social media seems to change all the time. Um, social media can be very useful because it can be quite wide, wide reaching and it allows us to instantly get communications out to people. Um, because we are the people issuing alerts over social media, we are in full control of those. So they can be quite useful for either alerting people to new safety information, to issue reminders or to draw attention to campaigns about medicines. Um, in Africa, um, 
social media use is growing along with use of the internet in general. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the different types of social media tend to be used differently in each country. Um, we have traditionally always used Facebook and Twitter to send out the information. We also increasingly use LinkedIn as well as Instagram. Uh, and we've also put some videos on YouTube as well, because this can be a very good way to um, put information out there. People don't always respond to text messages. Sometimes they find it easier to watch a video. The big disadvantage of social media um, is basically it relies on followers and reach. So if people aren't following you on social media, they won't get your messages. Um, I don't think the MHRA has as many followers as we would like. Um, and it's something that I think we're working on. But because there's been quite a lot of focus on the MHRA because of the COVID-19 vaccines, I think that our followers on social media are rapidly growing. Next slide, please. Um, so just to mention a few other ways that we can communicate, which I haven't covered so far. So we get sent inquiries from healthcare professionals, as well as members of the public and journalists. Um, journalists tend to approach us with a request for information um, to a very short timeline. For example, they might ask us one afternoon for something they want information on the next morning. So we have to react quite fast to those types of requests. Sometimes we might publish our findings in journals, which is a good way to get information to a large audience. Um, you know, sometimes as part of our routine safety monitoring, we might do our own in-house observational study using CPRD. And where that information is of interest to people, we will publish that in a journal. Uh, we can also work with other regulators and bodies. Um, we've been increasingly working with um, other countries like Health Canada, um, as well as Swiss Medic. Um, to sort of work jointly on applications, um, as well as to sort of share information about drug safety and where there might be a need to communicate. Um, we can also use apps like the Yellow Card app um, or the Web Radar um, reporting app um, to include information about drug safety. You know, there can be a special sort of news screen that you can include in those types of apps to communicate new information. And we can, of course, make use of our own websites and web portals to, to send that new information. We do have to be mindful about accessibility issues though. The UK government um, is very strict on this type of thing and any information you put on the web has to be readable by a web reader. So someone who has visual problems can still hear that information if it's read out to them. Um, you can't have too much information tied into figures and diagrams for the same reason. Um, and some things are essentially not allowed. We can't have Q's and A's, for example, you know, questions and answers. We have to find a way to send out the same information, but in a different way. So websites have some limitations, um, but they can still be a useful source of information. Next slide, please. So a very important part of communications is measuring success. I mean, I have a picture there of a message in a bottle because we might think we're communicating information on safety. But if people either aren't getting that message or they're understanding it, then that's a real problem. So if we actually have a formal way to measure um, if messages have been received, understood and acted upon, then you know, that's really good. It's been a requirement in the EU. Um, and because we essentially follow what's done in the EU, also in the UK, to monitor outcomes for all risk minimisation activities since 2012. Um, it's a requirement for companies to do that as well as the regulator. So we have to have a plan in place for how we're going to make sure things have been received and understood. There are different ways to measure this. These are called process indicators and outcome indicators. So process indicators are essentially um, a bit less refined because they're essentially was the message received. So you can monitor, for example, how many email read receipts you've had. Um, you can follow up with recipients to ask if they actually receive the information as our colleagues in devices do. You can look at page views on the web where you're directing people to the internet for information. We can also ask was the information understood? Um, so this can be done by surveys or through questionnaires, but because people tend to take part in these voluntarily, sometimes you get a bit of a biased response. The other more key way to measure success is through outcome indicators. So this is essentially either did clinical practice actually change? So you can look at prescribing trends using drug utilization studies in large databases. And really importantly, what you really want to know, because what you want to achieve here is, did the risk of a particular adverse reaction decrease? 
So again, you can use observational studies to look at um, whether a particular side effect to a medicine was reported less often after you have communicated. And these types of studies tend to need to run over a long time. You need to have a decent amount of baseline data so you can look at the way in which your medicine was used before you communicated and then look at how it was used afterwards. But that can be a very good way to clearly demonstrate the impact of any communications that you've had, that you put out or equally demonstrate they've had no impact whatsoever, in which case you might need to go away and think about that a bit more and think about whether you need to find a new way to get that information across. Next slide, please. So I'll talk a bit about handling the press and the media, and sometimes it is a case of handling. Um, but generally, you know, we, when we talk about media handling, it's, it's thinking proactively about how we are going to make best use of the relationships we have with the media to communicate new information. So when we're thinking about media, this can co cover all kinds of things. So you might think the media is kind of TV and newspapers, and it is. Um, but it also encompasses other, other media as well. So um, magazines, medical press, TV dramas. Um, TV dramas are a, a kind of an interesting way to get new information about drug safety across because sometimes we work very closely with script writers for soap operas to actually include um, a particular storyline about side effects to medicines. I think it was Coronation Street that had a a storyline about slimming pills being abused by one of the people on the program. Um, and I know in casualty as well, sometimes we've we kind of worked storylines in via casualty, which is a, a TV drama about hospital. Um, so that can be a slightly unusual, but very effective way to get new information across. Um, I've included magazines because um, magazines are read by millions of people. And it, because of that, it can be a very good way to get new information about drug safety across to people. Um, it's good to be proactive where you can. So if you can go out with something in the way of a press release, for example, to put new information out there, then that's good. Sometimes you can also be reactive where you don't necessarily put information out, but you are prepared in case of questions. Um, in this case, we develop what are called lines to take. So if we get asked a particular question on a, a drug safety topic, we will have some lines to take on that. So for example, Statins, we know, are associated with, um, in very severe cases, rhabdomyolysis, um, but more commonly and less severely, people have muscle aches and pains. And we, and we know that for statins, that's a very well recognised side effect. So, you know, a line to take on that would be, you know, statins are an important medicine for reducing cholesterol. Um, they're known to be associated with muscle aches and pains. Um, however, if you get the following symptoms, then let your doctor know as soon as possible. So it's important to think proactively about what the lines to take might be. And it always involves establishing something about, you know, the medicines used for this and it's important medicine for that, for that particular disease, as well as what the information about the risk is and what practical advice you can give to people. It's important to think about timing as well. Um, if we need to put out some information urgently, um, we can... You know, we can put a press release together very quickly. We might want to apply what's called an embargo, where we put information out to the press, but we ask them not to publish anything about it until a particular time or date, which gives them some advance notice, gets, gives them time to prepare articles about, um, about the topic, which they find quite helpful. Um, if you can have a dedicated press and media team to coordinate all these activities and ensure consistency of messaging, that's good. Um, we have media specialists in the UK who are particularly skilled in finding the right kind of language to use or who have good relationships with journalists and know the best way to reach them. Next slide, please. So one very important part of um, handling the press and media is to have a communication plan. This is something which in the past we used to do for big drug safety issues, but increasingly now we tend to develop a communication plan for pretty much anything that we would consider putting in our drug safety update bulletin. So a communications plan, we have a set format for this. This would include a summary of the issue in the background, um, just for internal use. We would set out what our public health objectives are. So for example, we might want to prevent use of a medicine in, particu in a particular patient population. We would also think about the communications objectives in terms of who the audience is, 
who the stakeholder and partner organisations might be, where we can seek input on the messaging, um, what the key messages will be for both healthcare professionals, patients and their carers. We also have a section on strategy, just in case there are other activities ongoing, or maybe NHS England or the National Health Institute of Health and Care Excellence is going to communicate on this. We might want to coordinate timing as well as messaging with them. Um, and also something about the timeline and timing of this. Generally, think, generally, we would also include in our communications plan what the communications themselves are actually going to be. So if we're going to put out a press release proactively, then we will include a draft of that. This would generally be written in patient friendly language, thinking again about kind of average reading ages. We need to make sure we use plain English and very simple language that people can understand. Um, there might be some targeted guidance towards healthcare professionals, which maybe doesn't need to be quite so patient friendly because healthcare professionals will understand the medical text and jargon. Um, but if there is advice for patients, then we would include that there. Um, if we are planning to put something on social media, we would normally include our draft social media messages uh, as part of the comms plan. And we would also try to think proactively um, about what questions we might get on this as well as what the answers would be. This can almost be fun because you will put yourself on the spot and think about well, what would the awkward questions be if I was wanting to know more about this? And it makes you really think about have you actually written um, a well, you know, a, a well written a press release? You know, have you covered all the main points? Have you left anything unsaid or included anything that might worry people? So thinking about the questions and answers is a really important part of this. You would also want to monitor the reach and the impact. Um, of your communications. So you might have plans for sort of monitoring hits on social media or on your website, um, or, you know, asking, following up with people to ask if they've actually received and understood the information. Next slide, please. Uh, on my slide, I've got a couple of pictures from the Daily Mail, which I can't see on the screen at the moment. Um, we have a newspaper in the UK called the Daily Mail, uh, which likes to use headlines. So, um, yes, the two headlines I got up are swine flu, what we're going to die, and swine flu jab linked to killing nerve disease. Oh, yes, there they are. <clears throat> um, so we need to think about crisis management when there is some information that we urgently need to send out. So this is either because there is an immediate threat to public health and patients' safety is at risk, where there is an urgent, an urgent need to take some action, um, where large numbers of patients are likely to be affected, or because we are aware that there is some kind of concern or misinformation in the media. And the best ways to do this from a media perspective are to consider putting out a proactive press release, or um, if necessary, to hold a press conference where we will, you know, will put out a statement and journalists have an opportunity to ask questions and, uh, live that they can put to us. We can also make use of the rapid alerting systems that we have, like the central alerting system, using an appropriate level of alert. And we can also agree a very rapid dissemination of a direct healthcare professional communication. We can do that in a fairly short time frame and get that sent out very quickly. If we send it out via email, it's almost instant. Obviously, printing and posting letters takes a few more days. Next slide, please. So staying on the theme of crisis management, um, as a regulator, we have to make the best use of the tools we have at our disposal and think about acting in a timely manner. Really, time is of the essence because the longer you have an information vacuum, the more likely it is that other people will fill it with misinformation. Um, it's good to be proactive in communications and have a, an emergency action plan. And we also need to make sure that where companies are required to take some kind of action, that they have done that. Um, it's good to use different approaches to communication to make sure that we have the largest reach possible. We can make use of social media to get in, in messages out very quickly. Um, and it also means that we can issue further notices if we have to, to react to a developing or an evolving situation. Um, so we do make use of social media quite a bit, uh, but we make use of it for different reasons. So um, there are a few different types of social media, and um, I guess it's fair to say we use them in different ways depending on what the message is. So we tend to use Facebook for communications which are aimed at parents um, and older people. Basically, younger people, teenagers, people in their 20s, don't tend to use Facebook anywhere near as much as older people do. So um, although Facebook has lots of users, they tend to be a bit older and many of them are parents. So it's a good way to communicate information to parents. 
Instagram, on the other hand, um, is sort of a bit more youth orientated uh, and it's used much more by women than by men. So this can be a good place to get information across to women and on medicines used for women's health. Um, Twitter has a much broader reach across all age groups um, and it also, it's also very quick and very reactive. So this can be a very good way to get information across um, to lots of different stakeholders and a very wide audience and also to highlight campaigns. And because of use of hashtags, um, you can also um, communicate information that overlaps with other organisations. Increasingly, we use LinkedIn now as a way to target businesses as well as healthcare professionals. I don't think LinkedIn is used by anywhere near as many people as the other social media networks, but it is on the increase and it is a useful way to communicate to people, even though I don't think most people think of it as a communication network. People tend to think of it as a kind of job finding site, but actually because of the number of people that sign on to LinkedIn, it can be a good way to communicate information. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to briefly talk about an example of where we had to communicate in a crisis. And this is used in the example of um, Sartan medicines. So there's all kinds of um, angiotensin II receptor antagonists called um, Lazartan, Valsartan, things like that. Um, they're used for the management of hypertension and heart failure. But in 2018, um, we essentially discovered that there was an impurity in Valsartan. Uh, and it was particular batches of Valsartan manufactured in China. And they have been contaminated with a substance called NDMA, which can be carcinogenic at certain concentrations. So this led to a Europe-wide investigation into this issue. Um, and at that time, we worked very closely with the European Medicines Agency, as well as other member states through um, a rapid alerting system. We worked very closely with the HPRA in Ireland, who are our kind of counterpart in Ireland. We prepared for a public press release we made sure the minister was aware of this issue and the plan of communications that we were going to put out. We made sure there were clear instructions for people and created a Q&A. And ultimately, we recalled all the effective products. And this was supported by a media briefing. It wasn't all Valsartan products. It was only the ones that were manufactured in a particular plant in China. But it was very important because of the risk of carcinogenicity that we recall the effective products from patients as soon as possible. Next slide, please. So on the communications front, uh, we monitored the um, press reaction to the alerts that we put out. We had quite wide coverage in a number of sort of daily newspapers, as well as the pharmaceutical press, including chemist and druggist and the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical journal. Um, it also reached national newspapers, it was regional newspapers rather, um, and also had quite a wide social media reach. This is probably just because of the sheer number of people taking um, sartans and other medicines in the UK. We're talking about millions of people here. Um, we, we felt that our campaign was quite successful on this occasion because most journalists used the key messages and the quotes that were given to them and they didn't sort of make up things around the edges or fill in information gaps themselves, which can sometimes be a way to uh, lead to misinformation being put out when people haven't understood the issue fully. Um, off the back of that, there were some further investigations conducted, which led to the discovery of some other contaminants, which are also carcinogenic. And this widened the review to other angiotensin II receptor blockers. Um, and communications were needed at every stage there, just to make sure that the, the correct products were recalled and that people were aware of, of the degree of risk. Uh, it's now a, a requirement for companies to confirm that there is no contamination by these particular agents in the medicines that they produce. Uh, and I've just included there just a screenshot of the uh, Twitter alert that we put out. Next slide, please. So moving on to um, vaccines. So vaccines are a bit different to medicines because generally they're given to healthy people, not people with diseases. And pretty much everybody will receive a vaccine in their lifetime. And actually most people will receive several vaccines, particularly in childhood. So this means that millions of doses are given each year. Um, and then the pandemic scenario, potentially very large numbers of people will be given a vaccine. Now, essentially, everybody is a stakeholder just because everybody is likely to receive vaccines in their lifetime. But vaccine safety issues can have a huge societal impact um, because they can lead to vaccine hesitancy and low uptake, and that can impact on efficacy. So 
I'm sure you're all aware of the very well-known example of MMR vaccines and the risk of autism that were published by Dr. Andrew Wakefield in the 90s. These really undermined faith in the MMR, MMR vaccine. And because of that, lots of people chose not to have their children vaccinated with the MMR jab. Unfortunately, that led to a resurgence of measles and some deaths. Um, but measles had been up to that point fairly well prevented by vaccines. So that really was quite a negative health outcome. And the link with autism has been um, refuted. So unfortunately, it's impacted on health for no particularly good reason. So that's exactly the kind of thing that we need to avoid when it comes to vaccine communications. Next slide, please. <coughs> Um, so with vaccines, it's important to um, be proactive in your approach rather than reactive. You need to think carefully in advance about how you're going to handle communications with vaccines. Generally speaking, vaccines tend to have um, similar types of side effects to vaccines that have gone before if they are using the same type of vaccine technology. So you can, you can kind of plan in advance for the sorts of things you might monitor and how you might handle communications about that. We can perform very rapid signal detection process uh, and we can use sort of an ongoing rolling wave of monitoring drug safety. And we can also perform very prompt assessments and a very critical review of the data to a short time frame. Um, so it's important to um, liaise with other organisations as possible so you've got the widest possible data to, to draw down um, from as well as gathering all data. Next slide please. <coughs> oh sorry that was one of the points on that slide. Um, so I've already mentioned about communication plans. It's important to have communication plans in place um, and to provide balanced information in your, in your communications about, um, but you need to make sure that you are accurate without um, over overloading people with too much information. And you need to make sure you provide balanced information about benefits and harms. Next slide, please. <coughs> so when we talk about benefits of vaccination, there are two ways that you can do this. You can either talk about the benefits to the individual and try to persuade people of, of the use of vaccines in that way, or you can appeal to people by emphasising benefits to the community. And people are wired in very different ways and they may not be particularly interested in the community benefit, but they may, may be interested, they can see a benefit for themselves. So it's very good to try to tackle both if and where you can. So particularly for vaccines used in childhood, um, you know, the benefits for the individual are that people will have to spend less time and money caring for sick children. Children who are vaccinated do spend more time in education than those who are not, um, which can increase um, their education level. <clears throat> and that in itself will then have knock on effects for economic prospects. Um, but the vaccination itself will also include um, health prospects. In terms of a community level, um, if the entire population is going to be vaccinated and that will introduce the degree of herd immunity which will mean the overall workforce is healthier there'll be fewer outbreaks of particular diseases and that will lower costs to the healthcare system and that can increase trade as well as increasing tourism so i'm sure some of you are aware of the concept of vaccine passports um i know from my own experience you have to have the yellow fever vaccine to enter thailand if you're going there from certain other countries where yellow fever is endemic so um, you know, this is not a new thing, but where you have where you can prove that you've had a vaccine, it can open doors for you quite literally. Next slide, please. Um, vaccination campaigns are very important with vaccines. Um, I included an incredibly old picture there from the polio um, vaccine campaign and some more recent ones for the flu jab and for the HPV, the human papilloma virus vaccine. Um, Campaigns have to be thought out very carefully. I need to make sure you're engaging all the right stakeholders, but they can be very effective in making people aware of the availability of a vaccine and encouraging them to make use of it. Next slide, please. It's also possible to carry out more targeted vaccine campaigns that basically focus on particular individuals. So in the UK, as part of a COVID-19 vaccine programme, um, NHS England has worked very closely with various healthcare providers and patient groups like MENCAP and the British Heart Foundation, um, as well as Kidney Research UK, to produce sort of targeted adverts to people who have particular healthcare problems um, so that they are aware of the importance of them being vaccinated against COVID 19. Um, I've also included, though, a small screen grab of Mary Ramsey talking about immunisation because. 
um, having sort of educated, well-respected experts talking about vaccines can be very useful to people because it provides reassurance about you know, their usefulness and their safety as well as how important it is that people receive the vaccine. Next slide, please. Um, I'm just going to finish on some issues around rumour, misinformation, disinformation. Um, so for, for all sorts of reasons, ever since vaccines were first introduced in, in the 19th century, there have always been people who have spoken out against vaccines. So there's sometimes it's anti-vaccine libertarians protecting civil liberties who feel that it should be a choice rather than a, something that people should be forced to do. Sometimes it's concerned parents who are not um, completely reassured about the safety of a vaccine and don't want their children to have it. Sometimes it's health conscious people who don't really believe in medicines and vaccines and think that they can counter disease just through healthy eating and clean living. But whatever the reason, you know, information which is anti-vaccine is out there. Unfortunately, though, these all have the net result of causing vaccine hesitancy, which the World Health Organization considers to be a top 10 health threat. Um, so, you know, you yourself may have heard various rumours about the COVID-19 vaccines and the coronavirus itself. You know, some of the popular ones in the UK have been about it causing infertility, <clears throat> about the vaccine, you know, inserting 5G chips into us, all sorts of things are out there. Um, but there are ways to sort of counter this type of information, uh, disinformation. Um, Really establishing trust in authorities, governments and the healthcare system in general is really important when it comes to ensuring high vaccine acceptance. So that's really a cornerstone of this. But there are some other ways to do this as well. Um, next slide, please. So um, there is a very useful report published by UNICEF a month or two ago, um, which is called the Vaccine Misinformation Guide. And that has like a complete toolkit on how to counter misinformation about vaccines. I mean, the whole thing, you could probably run a, comp a complete se separate session on it on itself, but it has some very important, very useful tools that you can make use of um, to counter misinformation. So one of these is to ensure people can easily find credible, accurate and relevant information. Um, one is to regularly disseminate information to exactly the places that are talking about vaccine related issues. So if you're seeing lots of stuff on social media about vaccines, then that's the place you should be putting out your correct information about vaccines. Uh, we can also amplify trusted voices at so the World Health Organization, UNICEF, for example. We can preemptively debunk myths before they get established. Um, UNICEF called this pre-bunking. This is essentially putting out uh, information um, before misinformation has taken hold. And where misinformation has got out there and has almost become established fact in some people's minds, we can carefully debunk particular myths or rumours. And the way that UNICEF advised doing this is to basically lead with a fact, so state clearly um, what the facts actually are. You might, they might also include a warning that there is some kind of misinformation out there. Um, you can explain why the misinformation is wrong and also, again, repeat the fact, explain again what the truth is, and basically make the fact stickier or more believable than the myth is. Next slide, please. So I've just included a couple of examples on these last couple of slides um, about good examples of where misinformation has been countered. I particularly like this one, um, which paints the vaccine as a bunch of cowboys in the Wild West. Um, but this essentially slightly also counters a myth about changing DNA, which is something that people have said about the mRNA based COVID vaccines. Next slide, please. Um, there's also a completely different way of doing this here, set out on this slide, um, issued by one of the um, federal governments in the UK, eh, sorry, in the US. Um, this actually directs, directly puts down what the myths are and counters them um, on the right hand side of the slide of what the actual facts are and provides reassurance to people about what they should, should and shouldn't do. So this is, also, this is a more direct way of countering myths and misinformation, but it works very well. Next slide, please. Um, so just to summarise what I've covered today. So there are many different ways to communicate information about medicines and vaccines, and it's important to consider carefully what the key messages are, who the target audience should be, and what the best channels of communication might be. Uh, I've talked briefly about communicating in a crisis situation, which is largely doing it at speed with accuracy and to the right people. 
I've talked about the importance of communications planning and the importance of measuring outcomes so that you know that your messages are getting through to people. I've talked a bit about media handling and, and um, media planning. And I've talked a bit about special considerations around communications in vaccines, uh, including the importance of campaigns and, how, and presenting balanced information about benefits and, and risks. And I've also talked a little bit about misinformation and how to tackle it. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time, but I'm happy to take any questions that anyone has. Thank you. Well, Catherine, thank you so much for, for taking us through that. As you said, we, uh, we are at our allocated time. We can overrun by a couple of minutes. We've got we had a couple of comments uh, come in through the the Q and A box. Um, one was more of an observation, saying that the uh, most effective means of communication in Ghana, as an example, is uh, is WhatsApp. And I know from from work we've previously done in China that WeChat uh, is a hugely uh, effective comms tool, a bit like uh, WhatsApp there. So. I think that is that is a correct observation, and I, I would agree with it. But I think you would need to be given the phone number to join to create the WhatsApp group, if you like, uh, to to reach that audience. So if people are are, are providing their their contact information, I think a WhatsApp uh, broadcast would would be very effective. Then um, the, the next question was for crisis management apart from press conferences press releases and uh, the HPCs what other methods are useful and Catherine I think you you went through a number of tools and channels that that are available I think in my experience and view that the the press release uh, or the press conference can give a huge amount of information and that would be backed up by the written information uh, that would be available on, on the official web website, etc. But I also think to supplement that, we use social media a lot with the link within the social media message. So you would just send out the headline and then put the link to the full information. So I think it's kind of a belt and braces that you tailor your message to a particular channel or audience, but then provide as a supplement to that, the links to get the full information um if if the audience is is minded to to do that would you agree or want to add anything to that Kevin? no i think that covers it pretty well mick actually um i suppose for me the really key thing about communicating a crisis is being really careful to make sure that you get the right messages out there and that the message is sent out in the right order um i mean i wasn't involved last week but there was um, I know we had a, like a live press conference about mm. the emerging risk of, of central venous um, sinus thrombosis with the AstraZeneca COVID vaccine. And, um, you know, the, the way that information was presented, it started very much with the kind of the benefits of the vaccine, why it's important to have it. It moved into, you know, the data, what the new advice is, but it didn't start out with, you know, any alarming headlines about the risk it was it started out with very reassuring statements about the vaccine which seemed to me exactly the right way to do it so i guess the the messages themselves are as important as the media if you see what i mean yeah ab absolutely i think um one of the other things that the the, the final questions come in here around um debunking misinformation um I think this is an important one where there are credible people, people in authority who um, are spreading misinformation. And maybe they, you know, a bit like an Andrew Wakefield that, that you referred to, um, people with a respected title who are maybe coming from another angle. And you, you, we've, we've seen this uh, with, with COVID. Um, and I think the, the, uh, people like the chief medical officers, chief scientific officers, the heads of regulatory agencies like our like our own have an important role to play in, you know, being consistently in the media, um, putting out the right information, giving reassurance, giving facts around what is, uh, um, you know, the licensing process and the post licensing experience, I think are, are really important to um 
just counterbalance and, and drown out um, effectively uh, some of these other noises. I don't know, Catherine, you want to add? Yeah, I think that's exactly right, Mick. Yeah, the important thing to get the is to get the correct information out there. Um, we don't necessarily need to get into a, an argument with whoever it is is putting out the misinformation. The important thing is to make sure that the correct information is also out there as well, and potentially coming from several different channels. And as you say, that will ultimately drown out misinformation. And, and being able to amplify your your message is really important, Catherine. You you commented that um, the MHRA. Uh, doesn't really have that many followers on social media. But one of the things that I think we've done successfully in the past is use individuals and organisations who do have a large following to retweet our message uh, to amplify it and reach a bigger audience than we on our own can do. So partnering with organisations uh, and um, other, other people who have a large following we can identify them. We've got a particular message. We know people who are active in that environment who can amplify our message and reach a bigger audience. I think that that's a really useful tactic to to employ um, and one that we'd encourage. I think the other one that that I wanted to add to, which kind of comes back to the, the trusted voice, if you like, is Sometimes in, you, you mentioned the, the Q&A prep for awkward questions. I think this is vital when um, and, and media training, I think, is something that's really important. If you're going to be in the media spotlight, media training is invaluable and getting used to being asked difficult questions and prepping those difficult questions is, is really important. We've done this a number of times and um, we just throw out really awkward, horrible questions that may come up. You know, we, we run our yellow card system. We, we prepare for questions such as the yellow card scheme's rubbish. No one's heard of it. How do you handle that without getting angry or defensive uh, and just sticking to the facts, sticking to the, the correct information is, is really important coming across as, as measured and and control is not always easy in, in sometimes a hostile environment. So media training, preparing for those really awkward questions is, is I think, critical if, if you're going to be in that, um, in that spotlight, in that environment. So again, thank you, uh, Catherine. Uh, we've overrun, but thanks to colleagues for, for staying with us for, for the few additional uh, minutes. As mentioned, this is, uh, has been recorded. So please make colleagues aware of the recording and, and make it accessible to them. Uh, the poll is up. We'd encourage you to and ask you kindly to, to complete the poll. I did see a question around um, how to get a certificate. I think that will follow. I don't know, Mercedes, if you are able to unmute and maybe just advise colleagues of how the certificate uh, are, are made available for, for these sessions. Um, so usually after the whole module is complete, there's a thank you email that is sent and there's a link um, to request for the certificate. So currently um, for module three, we will send out the thank you email today and then there'll be a link um, for you to request um, the certificate for module three. However, for module four, um, that link will only be available once uh, module four sessions are complete. Thank you. Thank you, Mercedes. And uh, thank you, everyone, for your attendance today. And again, Catherine, thank you very much for taking us through uh, risk communications. Have a great Pleasure. day, everyone. Bye.